We have a great panel here, actually. It's a great um, a, a, a panel that's really deep in experience. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about them so you can understand after we get to the Q&A, you know, where you can direct questions on uh, what you've heard in the next half hour or so. Uh, Kamal Al-Saleli is an associate professor at Ryerson School of Journalism, uh, former theater critic uh, for the Globe and Mail, but he's written uh, for just about every quality publication in the country. Uh, interestingly, also taught theater at a couple of Canadian universities and uh, not worthy um, in journalism, really. He has a PhD in English literature uh, from the University of Nottingham uh, in the UK. He's uh, an author. He's got a new book coming out in three weeks called Brown, but he's the author of uh, Intolerable, a memoir of extremes, and it's been uh, either won or nominated uh, for any number of distinguished literary awards. Uh, Susan Margetti is executive director for uh, radio and audio at the CBC, uh, previously was senior managing director at CBC Toronto and the Ontario region. And uh, her leadership within the Corp has uh, won numerous awards for her determination to promote uh, diversity uh, in her workplace. And Lauren Strapagale is a social news editor for BuzzFeed Canada, uh, often covers issues uh, dealing with uh, queer issues and uh, trans issues among Canadians. Previously worked at both uh, posts, the Huffington Post, National Post, uh, Canada.com, and she recently uh, helped edit a guide for uh, reporters and others on uh, how to cover and what words to use around the issues of sexual violence called the right words. So uh, let's have a little introduction and applause for our panel. Uh, from the gay press. Obviously, I was a theater critic, so that's kind of part of the job description in a way to be a, to be a gay man. Yeah, you taught theater. You just did it because you're a teacher. I so. preached the yeah. theater well, yes. And, um, and uh, Susan, what about yourself? Um, um, when I started out in the private sector, I wasn't the 60s, it was the 80s. Um, <laughs> but there, there, there very much was a culture of, you know, don't ask, don't tell. Uh, and you didn't. And uh, when I moved to CBC, which was 1988, it was like a completely different world. It was then, and it is today. And I think that you bring who and what you are to, to the table uh, in terms of the perspective. And I think that that perspective has definitely affected my body of work and throughout my career. I'm sitting on my microphone here, so I don't know, I don't know if that's like a good thing or something. CBC, the CBC audio is sitting on a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what this? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you said, you said uh, you know, there are still some people, though, um, I don't know about the CBC, but I know of other organizations that have not come out uh, mm -hmm. as, as publicly. Um, does that surprise you, first of all, and um, do you think, what, what do you think that's a, a question of? Oh, uh, well, we could spend days talking about tolerance uh, and the critical role, especially for the media, and in particular the public broadcaster, I think, has to play in terms of uh, an informed citizenry and educating people. But, you know, it's about fear uh, of reprisals. and uh, Even today? And even today. Even today, for all the distance uh, that we've come, I think even today there is uh, quite some distance to go. Lauren, do you think, was there a time where, uh, do you think sexualities mattered to your career? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, so what was interesting for me is I came out as I was sort of getting started in the journalism industry and as I was starting to cover queer and trans issues. So it was very personal for me, sort of fighting to get these stories into print, at the same time sort of fighting to figure out who I am and um, what my identity means for my career. And I think it has totally shaped uh, the focus of my work, um, the things that I cover. And it's been very interesting moving from an environment like the National Post, which is a very traditional print environment, somewhere like BuzzFeed Canada, where I could pretty much fly rainbow flags all day. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, did you find, did you begin in the, in the milieu of sort of advocacy journalism? Is that why you were attracted to journalism? And has that continued through time or is that losing some of its edge for you? I, I mean, sure. I think so many people get into journalism because I have this idea they want to save the world. I mean, I hope that's why we do journalism. I, I, I still think that's why I want to do it. Um, so yes, it was part advocacy. It was, here's an issue that needs more coverage, and that's something I can lend myself to. So you, you skipped Kamal's class when he was your professor. Do you okay. want to say your story right now? I dropped his class oh, two weeks in. <laughs> that's even worse. So, uh, so um, 
I know in my, in the television side of things, uh, I can't speak for the print side of things because I haven't worked in, in print newsrooms, but I know in television, um, I think it's fair to say uh, there has been progress made, that there are many, many people who are on television and anchors or as broadcasters who are out. Uh, but I think it's also fair to say that you can be gay but not too gay. What do you think of that? I did work in broadcast, maybe. Yeah. yeah. And by that I mean because the audience for television and because the audience for conventional television in particular, news and current affairs that we work in, tends to be older, that there is still a heightened sensitivity about how people sound, how people look, and how people act. You say that's true? I, I think that is for, uh, for on-air roles, but I also see that changing. Um, you know, f diversity in any kind, um, uh, in, in all its breadth and depth, is one of the things at CBC Toronto that we were working so hard to achieve, which was to bring, um, you know, two diverse hosts to our supper hour, which was uh, the first major market uh, television to have two diverse co-hosts on our uh, Toronto television show with uh, Anne-Marie Menelik <coughs> and Dwight, Dwight Drummond. I think in terms of uh, sexual orientation, you know, we've always been here, but, um, but we've never been more visible. And I, th I think for sure uh, when you are on camera, People call, for God's sake, about your hair. They call about, you know, you have too much eyeshadow on tonight, or that's the wrong color for you. So, you know, you can imagine in a society um, that, um, you know, looks at their television or uh, any visual medium that they're going to have a response. Is that changing? I think it is. Uh, is it acceptable? Uh, no. Uh, but uh, you you know, Kevin, you're from a TV culture. It is um, it is definitely part of the culture. Kamal, in your time in the Globe and Mail, um, did you have a did you have a, a moment where the declaration of your sexuality became much more public in the way that a broadcaster might have to do? No, I mean, honestly, not at all. I, I, the, being at the Globe um, as a gay, I mean, I. I I studied as an editor and before I became a theater critic, and and being gay was never ever an issue. And I'm not being, you know, it's not because I was, you know, in a, some a beat that's seen as soft or anything. Because I was, um, I had written um, uh, about being about being gay um, for Focus, like uh, before I became a, th a theater critic. Um, so it, I, I, I mean, I, I would I would I would say no, it wasn't. I, I felt much more self conscious of race. And ethnicity than I ever felt uh, on sexuality. So it, whenever something would happen and and it's didn't, like things didn't go my way, or, I, I would never say. I wonder if it's because I was gay. That 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 would that never even occurred. My um, uh, never even entered my mind. But but I I would say. I wonder is it because I'm sort of ethnic and come from a Muslim background. That would always be my. That's the first place of darkness I would go to. That's interesting. What what qualities does that kind of newsroom have that you? make an assumption that um, um, prejudice against sexuality is not part of what's happening? Well, well I, I, I was, I mean, in a way I was privileged with most of it was on the arts pages and, um, and, 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 and that in itself kind of um, uh, implied a certain, I would say bohemia necessarily, but a much more relaxed, uh, but, but I, I suspect if I were in the business section um, or, or covering Ottawa, um, I may have had, I may have sort of retreated into the closet, or I may have just decided that that this is not necessarily um, not necessarily relevant, or this is not it's not something I should exp I should be um, announcing. Whereas um, the first semester, the first sorry semester, I think as a professor all the time. Now uh, the first uh, the first few weeks, I was a theater critic. Um, I wrote a um, uh, a review of uh, a play at Buddies, and it was partly about bullying. And I said, and, you know, as a gay man who was bullied as a, you know younger, I think, and, and and that was, and a copy editor at uh, the Globe said, "Are you sure? Are you sure you want to say this? Because you know she's been there at the Globe for twenty years, and not uh, this is the first time a critic of any kind sort of declared." Uh, their sexuality as part of the review. So I hear you saying that sometimes it could be beat dependent within a news organization. I, I mean, I, 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 listen, I don't want to out to anyone, but I, at least I know a couple of uh, um, columnists at the Globe who are, who are uh, gay, but they're not out. Um, and they, you know, sort of on the nationals, um, on the national, and that's, uh, that's a decision that they have made, and that, I think that's, that's, their, that's their business. Uh, Lauren, is, it, is, it, is acceptance, um, 
age dependent. I mean, as somebody who is now working at BuzzFeed, which is a very different vibe from the National Post or Canada.com even, mm -hmm. uh, what have you observed as you've moved from sort of larger news organizations that tend to be dominated by dudes my age to one where, where we're like not even welcome in the door? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, um, yeah, there's a huge difference. Because I, I started at the Huffington Post, which is, you know, similar to BuzzFeed, that kind of startup feel digital and young. Um, I do feel like when I, so I was at Canada.com, and we sort of, our team got rolled into the National Post. So one day I was like, go to the third floor, you work with the National Post now. Um, and I do remember sort of retreating back into the closet a little bit, because I was in a very different environment. Um, and it's not that anybody had come up to me and was like, keep the gay tone down or anything like that. It's just sort of this feeling of the culture of the newsroom isn't, isn't one that welcomes that. Um, so it's not like I was purposely hiding myself, but I was just, I, I was not talking about it. Um, or I, 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 I'd be pitching things that uh, talked about queer people or trans people I remember them not being received as well as they would have at other publications or somewhere like at BuzzFeed. Um, but then switching over to BuzzFeed, yeah, I'm like 100% gay every day. It's like super gay because that's, that's the kind of environment that BuzzFeed has created. Um, I mean, we have dedicated reporters and editors just to cover LGBT issues um, at the US and UK offices. It's the kind of environment where diversity of like whatever is so welcome. Like they want to hear your, your viewpoints. That's awesome. So, I mean, talking about the demographic issue then, I guess the question is, because I've, I've, I, I noticed this in my own life, that um, you know, my son's level of acceptance, the level of acceptance of my generation versus my parents' generation, I had to live that you know, um, as, as we were becoming accustomed to Alex's truth. Um, I'm wondering whether or not in your organizations, do you see um, acceptance of that kind of um, diversity growing faster than the way the demographics are changing. And by that I mean, you know, um, the, I mean, true progress isn't, isn't just the younger generation growing up and taking, taking uh, the positions of the older generation. True progress is that it's, it's beating that and it's going faster than that. Susan, do you find that at the CBC? Uh, well, I, I would call the CBC, you know, a safe haven in a lot of ways. Um, it's really a very inclusive employer. It's worked very hard. Uh, you know, it's... Um, legislated under employment uh, equity uh, and just the work we've done in Toronto locally I, I was asking a few people today and they're like Susan it's just not an issue it doesn't come up we created a very diverse team at CBC Toronto locally we're doing that now it's been six seven months in my new job at the network we're beginning to to um, to push forward even further at a network level at a national level but you know sometimes it's like you do you live in this um, world where you feel safe, where you can be yourself, uh, where it's not an issue, it doesn't come up, it's just not important to the discussion. Um, and then you walk out of that building and you have an incident or you have an experience and, and you remember that you, you live in this uh, little society, in this little world that's quite inclusive, quite welcoming. I remember years ago when I was first starting out, um, and I was one of those people who was really pushing to do stories on AIDS in the 80s. And I uh, kept getting turned down, turned down, turned down. And, and the reasoning was, well, it's a, it's a gay plague, Susan. It only affects gay people, and they don't listen to us. Um, so, you know, we, we, we don't need to, to tell these stories. Um, and I would continue to push to tell those stories. We would tell those stories. I would go to the public broadcaster and it would be just the whole level of discourse uh, and discussion on the stories that we were telling was so different. And that is the reason, actually, I made the transition. There were stories I wanted to tell that I couldn't tell uh, where, where I was. But, um, you know, it's, it's been a long road for sure and a lot has changed but there's still distance to go for sure. What do you think um, as far as pace of change? Uh, I mean, I'm not in a newsroom right now, but I have the, sort of being part of the university and I, I see a place like Ryerson where diversity is, is kind of one of the pillars of that institution. Um, and yes, it, it's happening at a, at a pace that is faster than some of the older faculty, but it's not fast enough for the students um, because the students are coming at it from a completely, um, from a, you know, from a, I, I find it very hard to, 
if I, it would be a rare thing if any of my students would say anything that are homophobic or would even think about that. And um, so, so that's in, in relation to the, to, to the pace. But the place is also is, is, is something important because um, uh, we, we are all here in Toronto and, and, and it may be different in smaller communities and in smaller newspapers. And, um, and I don't want to stereotype smaller communities, but we do live in a, in, a, in a particularly diverse city and the city that has managed to sort of include diversity as part of its uh, sort of overall package. But, but you know, having done uh, readings in smaller communities and in smaller places, I didn't always feel very safe Having written a, a memoir that is, you know, about being, growing up gay in the Middle East, I haven't always felt incredibly safe. And this is within on southern Ontario or, or eastern Ontario. I haven't always felt that I should, after the talk, I should just walk around and mince around the streets of Kingston or something. But uh, I always, I always just kind of felt that um, I kind of ret again retreated to, to the closet and uh, you know, straight acting until I got out of there. <laughs> um. What about straight acting on social media? Because I know of an example at uh, the place I work uh, where uh, an anchor who's gay um, tweeted on Instagram a great picture of him and his boyfriend. Um, they're ripped and they're in the swimming pool and they're having a great time. Um, and I also know that um, there was some things said about that that might not have been said to me when I posted on Instagram a picture of my wife and I on the beach. Where, where is that, do you think? I mean, if, if people are willing to um, welcome... I mean, and I think there's an expectation now that people who are in journalism um, are very much more open about who they are as people. Do you see that there's a different standards uh, when it comes to, you know, either corporate media or social media or, or just what the expectation is about what, what is acceptable for someone that represents an institution like a newspaper or a website or the CBC or the CTV, that there are different standards there when it comes to social media and your behavior? I've, that's interesting because I've never felt like I had to hide who I am on social media. I mean, I've, I'm the millennial. We overshare on social media. Um, I, I do put a lot of myself out online. I've never, ever felt like it will be problematic in terms of my career to do that. Sometimes I do worry in terms of am I crossing a line into where my employer might worry that I'm becoming an activist? That was one of my concerns, especially working more traditional media, is if I'm being particularly political about LGBT issues um, on my Twitter, which I am often, my employer is going to think, we can't let you write about that stuff now. Hmm. Where do, where, what's the policy at the CBC? Because, I mean, um, a good number of my friends work there. Um, and I must say that in, almost in private television, I find the social media accounts of some of the anchors are more open than they are among CBC on-air people. Yeah, there are uh, um, journalistic policies in place for, very hard for millennials um, who want to overshare. Um, you know, it, on the one hand, it's, it, it's, it's fascinating time, isn't it? Because we, we want people to know and understand us uh, as people. Um, but when you're uh, a key journalist or working as a reporter in the field, you are expected to be, if you're, if you're on Twitter and you're on um, a corporate account, a uh, CBC account, you are expected to be tweeting um, at, at, a, at a different level and in a different way, content that is reflective of our journalism. It's, it's hard because then on the other hand, as I say, we, we want people to, to know well, and appreciate our, our One folks. of the things that, that, that you respect about Jennifer McGuire and some advice that she gave you was that it's about the audience. And the audience is changing, and their expectations of wanting to get to know the person who is their filter is changing. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that kind of um, separation uh, is appropriate if what we have to do as, as traditional journalists is gather new viewers, gather new readers, gather new people interacting with the people who are the filter? They, 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 they're not as trusting of journalism unless they know you, is, is my presupposition. Oh, no, I, pr I appreciate what you're saying. Well, um... Uh, I totally appreciate And I'm the one who said that to Jennifer, actually. Jennifer uh, actually said at my farewell locally that uh, one thing about Susan, she said she is all about the audience. Um, yeah, absolutely, for sure. I, 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 I come at everything in terms of the audience is changing, and we too have to change. Um, you know, how much, I don't set journalistic policy. 
Um, my job is to uh, set the direction for public radio and to adhere to journalistic policy. Um, and it, it is something for sure, as it's, you know, it's an organic living thing. It keeps evolving and changing. But for sure, we do ask our journalists to take the, um, the highest road and to present as impartial as possible. Uh, and, and that is a tricky place in a social media world where it's just so much more conversational and, you know, I was downtown last night and whatever. <laughs> um, so so it, it's, it's a crossroads that we're at in terms of uh, how we present on social media. I'm interested in each of your answers to a question of um, self-declaration in, in your reporting duties and if that should ever be done. Is there ever a point where that matters? Uh, if I think back on... On my reporting career, I've never had to declare myself as a single white man uh, and a straight man. I, the only time I've ever had to declare myself in my journalism is when I did a story on my son who is gay because I felt wrongly or, or, or not, or, or incorrectly, or correctly or incorrectly, that uh, my audience needed to know that I came to this from a position of um, absolute civil rights. And it's the only time I've ever declared myself. And I wasn't sure after I did it, like, why did I have to? You know, um, have you, have you self-declared and should anybody even be self-declaring in their duties of being a reporter? Um, it, it, it entirely depended on the story. And, it, and, and at, whenever I've written about, say, the Muslim community or the Arab community, I've always, I mean, even in case you didn't get that from the name or the picture, um, uh, I, I, I've always... <laughs> Well, it, I've, I mean, I, I, I have just because I felt I, I, I wanted to, to some extent, bring in the insider's view into this. But, it, but on some level, I kind of I envy you that you never had to declare who you are. Whereas, um, you know, growing up gay and, and or, or racialized, it's it's all I knew, and it's I was never able to. I mean, and, and yes, I've written about stuff that's not related to being gay and not related to uh, being racialized. But, but at the moment, about everything I write seems to be about being racialized and everything I ask to talk about uh, is, is either, you know, the, the sexual identity or, or the racial identity. So it, it, on some level, I feel like it has been a burden and there are times when I just wish I could just write about technology and something that, I, that, that doesn't include um, having to deal with Islamophobia or homophobia uh, or anything with phobia in it. And, um, and, um, and, and that's a, you know, it, uh, it's, it's a burden, but it's also a privilege because it, there are a lot of communities that are looking to you to represent or to say. But, but, I, but I wrote about homophobia, right? And I, right. Didn't, I didn't feel the need to declare, like, why, yeah. why is it only gay people that can write about homophobia? Well, I should hope not. Like, right. I should exactly. hope that, that yeah. everyone will. Yes. Yeah. 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 You know, years ago, um, I, I lived with a woman, a uh, proud uh, Jamaican-Canadian woman, Right at supper time, the phone rings. She answers the phone. I would not have answered the phone, but she answers the phone. And I hear, uh-huh, 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 not on the phone. She hangs up. And I said, what in the world was that? And she said, oh, it was a survey. And I said, what did they ask you? And she said, they asked me if I was a member of a visible minority. And I said, not on the phone. <laughs> um, <laughs> The great thing about radio, it's how you think, right? And I love radio for that. And maybe that's why I always gravitated toward radio in the very beginning, um, is that the beauty of it is it's intimate, it's immediate, it's portable, but it's about how you think. You are not a person of color on the radio, but how you think does take us to new places and deeper and more nuanced discussions. Um, so is declaration, do you think, less, less a part of radio, self-declaration on I, certain issues? I think it is. Yeah. yeah. What do you think? I've never felt the need to declare like in, in something I've written, um, my sexuality or anything like that. Um, I think declaring who I am say on social media has been useful in my career and for like for getting contacts in the community, for becoming known as a person who's safe to go to with stories concerning queer and trans people. Um, but I do think, it's interesting they're saying that like on, on radio there's sort of no need to do it, but I think 
it's, I think we've reached a point where it is important to state what your perspective is often. Um, and that's how it comes through, in perspective. Yeah, sure. But I mean, what, what, so when you're on a radio program and you're talking, I think it's, it's good to declare this is my background. Yes, it's, it does come through in what you're saying, but I think um, as we're trying to include more diverse voices in media, um, I think it's good for people to step up and say, this is my perspective on something. Do you, do you find people um, are still quick to ghettoize? Are the kinds of stories that they think you can, I mean, it sure. sounds ridiculous to even ask the question in 2016, but do you find that? Still? Yeah, and I think that's, uh, and I think you sort of touched upon this a little bit, is when you are like the gay person in the newsroom or the woman or the black person, because in some newsrooms there is one black person, um, you feel this tug of, are they expecting me to write about these issues because of who I am? Am I doing it because they're expecting me to? Or am I doing it because I really care about it? Am I doing it because I feel like if I don't, no one else will? You kind of get caught in this feeling of, am I being ghettoized or am I ghettoizing myself? And I, I don't know what the answer is still. Kevin, I, well, okay, I think that's one of the biggest issues right there, hiring. Hiring's absolutely critical. You have one of anything, and that's exactly where you get into that situation. I mean, it's creating a team that actually authentically looks like the public I was just on a stage a couple of weeks ago in Paris. I was talking about this very subject, uh, remaining relevant in this changing time of changing technologies. And all of the sessions were on podcasting and, you know, um, uh, uh, Twitter and social media and, um, and, and technologies, without a doubt, is completely changing our industry. But what are you sending out on those technologies? What are the content choices you're making? Where do content choices come from? They come from ideas. Where do ideas come from? They come from people. Where do the ideas from the people come from? They come from their lives and their perspectives. And they bring that to the story meaning table, which is why if you actually want to be more reflective of the changing face and voice of this country, you got to create a team that authentically reflects that makeup. If you don't have any people in your newsroom who are gay, except maybe one, um, all of a sudden you do get into that situation. There is now a whole body of uh, research um, that you have to hit at least 30% diversity uh, in what, whatever your business in order to change the culture. At the 30% mark, you stop having those conversations. So when I left CBC Toronto locally six, seven months ago, it was 32% diverse. Eight out of 10 of the hosts were themselves diverse. The staff makeup was 32% diverse. Uh, we had two LGBT people in the leadership team. Diversity wasn't even a discussion anymore. Like you just stop. You have a whole different level of discourse when you begin to change the team and hiring is such a, a, a critical role. We're just beginning at a network level. Um, we've gone from two, actually, we haven't made an announcement yet, so I'm not going to go too far down this path. But I was just going to say, <laughs> we've gone from two to, to, to soon, uh, 10 uh, diverse hosts at the network level in six, seven months. Um, we are, again, beginning, embedding this right into our mission mandate uh, to connect, reflect, and engage the nation, one person, one story, one song, one event at a time. Start right there. All your choices go up against your strategy. But if you don't fundamentally change inside, nothing fundamentally changes outside. And that's key. But to be fair, I mean, the CBC is a federal... Um, and you're federally also regulated, and you have, you have uh, that is part of the uh, sort of the hiring practices at a federal level. But you know the for-profit uh, media don't have the same obligation, and if they do it, um, there has to also be a business case for it uh, for them. Um, and I'm not saying there Can isn't. Can I give there. you the business case? No, no, I'm not saying there isn't the business. Before you go, before you go, but but you are also uh, because you are in, in, in broadcast and broadcast is, and in general, I, I think broadcast is, is regulated federally reg regulated more than yeah, than uh, hiring practices even in the private sector. Yeah. The but there's a social responsibility for the CBC without a doubt. Its right. mission mandate says it will reflect the changing <laughs> face and voice yeah. of the country. Um, I remember when that policy came out in 1991. Its policy. 1.1.1, I don't remember anyone rushing out to 
uh, to actually do do anything fundamentally differently at that time. But the business case, if you just take a show like Metro Morning, CBC Toronto 99.1, uh, that show was number six in the market. Uh, it had two diverse uh, people who tried to get diverse stories on the air in 2001. Um, they were often be met with, mm, we did that once. Nah, they're not listening to us. And when we began to change the, the team, uh, we began to change the content that was on the air, the guests we were booking, the music we were playing. Um, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, Metro Morning went to number one for the 85th time in Toronto. And may I say in December 2003, when it went to number one for its very first time, um, it was like the first time in CBC's history in Toronto, its largest market. Do you believe that there's a local aspect to that, though? That, um, I the... believe there's a hugely local aspect to that, but I also believe that in Canada's largest cities, I believe that our urban centers are fastest growing. Um, we continue to, to, to be a nation of immigrants, uh, and that um, you know the majority of Canadians live in larger cities. Also, Canada's population is aging. Immigrants are, um, in terms of the median age, younger. If you want to continue to grow younger and more diverse audiences in our most major cities, you absolutely have to go after that. It's not that's not local now. That's reflecting. So given, your given that progress, then do you think uh, Kamala, as someone who started at Extra, do you think the LGBTQ press still has um, a reason for being? And if so, what is that? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and let me be honest, like I, I, I started the gay press, but I also couldn't wait to get out of it because I didn't, I, I don't, I didn't, I didn't want to be uh, ghetto wise because you know, I didn't want just to be the gay writer. I mean, that's also from, from the point of view of the, the diverse persons being hired. You don't want to think they just hired you for the diversity card, but they hired you for your talent or for your uh, ideas. Um, but but um, it, it's sad to see what happened to Extra particularly because it went to from um, uh, visible presence in the city in, in, in news boxes to digital only and this is not a knockdown on digital only um, uh, uh, outfits but uh, but there are stories and there are um, uh, both um, sort of long form and news stories that were only covered in 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 extra um, they, they, they covered issue to do with particularly violence against um, uh, uh, sort of gay men and, and women um, sort of the, the the subcultures within gay culture whether it's the uh, you know the uh, the sort of SNM or bear culture or drag culture and these are all sort of anchors of our community and um, and I feel that with with a diluted gay press because like barely existent gay press that we have lost a lot of those stories. Although I was reminded uh, during the Rob Floor thing and I'd be interested to hear your, your thoughts on this I mean um, most of the newsrooms blanket coverage great man lying in state uh, terrible loss and then it took a few tweets to remind us that he was homophobic Terribly homophobic. Even when he was in office, it, was, it wasn't talked about. I mean, it, it was. The fact that he never went to Pride came up often. Um, his being at the cottage or whatever, when he tried to get the Pride site taken down during the Winter Olympics. But I find generally, uh, even today, um, traditional news is more eager to talk about different kinds of diversity. LGBT sometimes like, falls by the wayside, especially trans issues, um, which is why I think when Rob Ford passed, it took a while do you know what's interesting to me? Like, I, I grew up at a time when men ran newsrooms, period, end of sentence. At CTV News, there is not a single man in a senior leadership position in the news division. And that's largely true at the CBC News as well. Why is this still a problem if women have won the right to run these news organizations that the argument for diversity still exists? Um, the, I was, uh, there's just a recent study um, that, that actually suggests that um, that uh, uh, white sort of mainstream white men actually um, um, benefit very little from diversity high, from at, at executive level from diversity higher, whereas women and people of color are actually penalized for diversity hires or for in, for encouraging di the diversity and 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 there's a whole I would be happy to tweet it out later but um, yeah, and that people are happy to hear mm. about diversity if a white man's talking about it. Mm. Um, but I think to your point, yes, there's a lot of female leaders in the newsrooms so that doesn't mean that they're not white and able-bodied and cisgender and straight and that they're not embodying all the same values that the men prior to them had. Yes, it might be different and things are obviously changing, but just because you have a woman in the position of power doesn't mean things are, there's a fundamental change.
even though that they have suffered the lack of diversity themselves to get to that position, that's that's an interesting insight. Well, sure. I mean, I've seen studies and, and essays and whatever with the idea of like, it's still for women to be able to climb the corporate ladder has to embody th those same values that got the men there. Um, not that there aren't some great women leading, there's tons of them, uh, but it's not as if corporate values have undergone this great change. They haven't. Okay. I'm sure there's some questions. There's some great conversation here, I hope. Um, anybody, uh, you can direct them. You can just throw out a question. Uh, anything, any observation that you've had? Come on. I'm always reminded of how that old habit from grade school of never sitting in the front row <laughs> lasts forever. <laughs> and now it's like, put up your hand and ask a question, right? <laughs> Good. There you go. One bank CEO in particular said to me, I never thought about this issue because it didn't really affect me. Um, but then I realized that if we don't have proper representation in our bank, and if those people aren't paid properly, and if there's you know, pay inequities, that's a problem. And if that same kind of trend trickles throughout Canadian society, that's a huge problem, especially for our bank, because we can't sell them you know, mortgages and mutual funds and all the cool stuff that we want to offload on consumers. Um, if people aren't compensated properly and if there isn't, uh, you know, proper re representation in Canadian culture. So that's when uh, I came to realize uh, that this was important and fundamental to business case. So within the paradigm of his business case? Well, I... Somewhat. Well, he admitted it, it never right. affected him, so why, he, why should he think right. right. So I, I'm wondering why this is such a hard sell for mainstream media organizations. I mean, why can't people understand that if you're not telling these stories, you're not telling comprehensive stories about Canada, you're, you're ignoring segments of the population that you know may be potential leaders. And I'm, I'm just, I'm wondering what it's going to take uh, for that understanding to sink in. That basically, if you're uh, an owner of these news organizations, your own, um, you know, profitability is going to be impaired if you don't, if you, if your newsrooms don't reflect the general population. And particularly, not just the news or not just the journalists, but if your leadership teams don't um, reflect the general population, the mastheads, people who are in positions of power. It's, it's, I don't understand why this is so difficult, and I don't understand why people are being told, um, oh, well, you know, we have cut back. This is not a priority. I don't understand why this is a second, uh, secondary issue that people think about. So I'm just wondering what you guys think it would take uh, to bring this to the forefront and for to understand that it's fundamental to the business case. Okay, well, I have two theories. Um, one of them is that if you look at the the leadership in a lot of newsrooms, it's still particularly old and white and straight and cis. Um, and these are many of these people simply do not care. I'm going to be honest; they don't care. They they look at the idea of diversity and see it as like a nice bonus. They think, oh, it would be nice if we could you know, get some freelancers to talk about whatever, um, but don't actually go through the trouble of considering on a day-to-day -day editorial basis what the stories are that are important to people of backgrounds other than theirs. I think it's like as sadly simple as that a lot of the time. And I think it, there's also a case when you're looking at especially newspapers, a dying medium. Um, they're really trying to hang on to uh, their core readership, which are generally people who are older and wealthy, homeowners. Um, if you ever look at the... like the advertising um, packages for things like the Globe and the Post are looking at families who, you know, have a certain income, have a certain sort of class background. Um, and if they're trying to hold on to those people, they're not looking at expanding into covering diverse people. They're trying to hold on to that core before they lose everything. Uh, so to be completely honest, I think if you're looking at traditional media, what it's going to take is actually like a full collapse of the top leadership before we see real change. You know, I am... Um when we first started making our changes at CBC Toronto in 2001, we had a lot of research, but we brought in people from various communities and walks of life, not ahead of this or the CEO of that, but just folks who were key influencers in various communities and various organizations. And I'll never forget this one woman. She said to the team that was assembled, 
Um, I, I don't listen to you. You're old, you're white, you're male, and you're worried. I really, <laughs> really objected to the worried part. Um, no one... Right <laughs> no, the worried part. No one, no one was worried. Um, you know, I, I, I've done a lot of work with a lot of stations, and it's like, what gets in the way? And really, we could spend a lot of time talking about what gets in the way. But one of the things is status quo. Um, people see loss. They don't see gain. You have to sell the gain if it's going to fundamentally change. But I also think uh, the collective agreements can be an impediment, that uh, the union seniority in a lot of newsrooms uh, protects people of my generation. And so it makes it much, much more difficult, unless I will step aside, to, to enact the kind of change that you want under limited budgets. Um, so I agree with you. I mean, I love some of the stuff that's going on in the Boston Globe and some of the newspapers in the United States that are completely inverting their management structure. But they've had to go bankrupt first. They've had to get rid of their collective agreements. Uh, they've had to work, as the American networks work, 100% contracts. Then they're much more flexible to enact a kind of uh, changes in their workforce. But, but that hasn't happened here. But you know, I, I work in a unionized environment. Uh, and when I first came in in 2001, we had, OK, this was a lucky break. We had four vacancies. We hired strategically for those vacancies. We began to build a team. It's, you know, I was talking about diversity really recently, and someone said to me, oh, Susan, hope you have more money. It's going to take more money. No, it's not going to take more money. It's about choices. You have a choice in terms of this guest or that guest, this subject or that subject. You know, I want to get to a place, I think we've done a fairly good job of doing and covering um, the LGBT community and the stories and issues. I trust my team. If there's an issue, they're on it. I want to get to a place where that guest who's gay is booked because they're an expert on hockey or child care, um, where you know, it's radio. You don't have to declare anything. When you begin to speak and talk from your place in this world, maybe it's part of the story, maybe it isn't. Depends on the story, depends on the issue, depends on the person, depends on the circumstance. But I want to get to that place where um, you're, you're, you're not the person coming in to talk about the gay issue just happen to be a gay person who's there to talk about whatever. And that's kind of the next level, the next step up. Um, I do think our organizations, all of them, are changing. Uh, but at Ryerson recently, um, Lori Beckstead did a survey uh, just a few weeks ago of media organizations. And you could still, you could see the gap. Uh, it was a measurable gap in terms of um, hiring around um, uh, sexual orientation, around um, uh, people of color um, and, and, she, and, and men, women, the ratio still remains um, quite high in terms of uh, men, although again that is changing and that will change even more as more and more young women are graduating uh, from, from journalistic schools. But, but it's part of a shift and we're kind of midway through. Actually, I'm going to stop, uh, 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 because our our journalism school is, is predominantly women, I mean female, 80% of the population is female and has been like that for a couple of decades and we still haven't seen that change yet. Yeah, because who's been hired? And, and, and that's, that's, I mean, the, the fact that there, are more, um, that, that there are more women coming into journalism, that it, has not, it does not translate to more diversity at the hiring place and it's something I said in, in earlier um, uh, somewhere else. But also, um, the idea that... Always depends on the place, but the idea that sort of um, uh, sabotaging the collective agreement and going contract, the idea that pre precarity is going to create uh, change is also very dangerous because pre precarious working environment just perpetuate the same over and over again in order to survive. So I actually believe that a, a collective agreement is a better place to, to achieve diversity than a precarious work environment. Uh, gentleman in the back. Yep, you. There's a microphone there if you want to go to it, but if you have a good loud voice, we don't need to. Okay. 
Actually, we can't see you with the lights. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Pretend it's radio, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Amr Kumar. I run a website uh, that helps citizens take democratic action on different national issues. And uh, I was particularly interested in what Susan mentioned about the 30% diversity tipping point that can happen. And my question is, is, do you think that there should be some type of legislation, provincial or national level, to encourage diversity? And if so, what type of legislation? you think should happen? Uh, questions for everyone. Well, well, CBC being, um, you know, federally regulated, it does fall under the Employment Equity Act. There are four main groups in employment equity, and it's the law. Um, uh, women, um, category called visible minorities, Aboriginal peoples, and peoples with dis disabilities. And you're actually measured uh, on your achievement in those respective categories. You know, it's 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 never you know it's an ongoing process um, in 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 terms of um, in terms of hiring and in terms of growing the team. Um, while that's legislated, and I think legislation is important, but I don't think there are happy accidents um, in this world. So in a, in addition to 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 legislation, um, you know you have to continue to. To really uh, create that culture of inclusion, and for me, I've I've seen it start at the bottom. I've seen it start at the top, but it takes leadership um, and commitment. And when you get those opportunities, taking advantage of those opportunities, you need to see the possibilities and the outcome uh, in, in order to build that. Whether I worked for the CBC or not, I would have done the exact same thing. Um, you know, it is about the audience changing, and the audience is changing in two ways. It's changing in terms of technology, and it's changing in terms of diversity. Um, I'm asking all my guys to live and play in a digital and diverse world, because we do. Uh, and those two, it's, see, it's all about the audience. Always goes back to audience with me, but those two are at the fundamental core, and I do think hiring is, is critical. What do you think about quotas? I mean, if you think about, I mean, we're living in a time where the federal cabinet, people seem to accept that there was a quota, uh, a, a gender quota there. I mean, if you look at the quota, quota about media in, in Toronto, then almost 50% should be diverse, like racially diverse, because the population is of the, uh, people who come from racially, uh, like, identify as racially diverse. In the 2011 census, it was something like 49.1%. Um, so if you're going to go for quota, it has to be something as, as, high, as, as high as that, if you want to be realistic. And I, I, I would actually invite everyone to look at the 2011 census. I did a lot of work on it for my book. And, 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 and the, 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 the face of Canada is changing. It's, it's, it's getting darker in a way, like the shade, a shade darker because of all the people coming from the global south. And as you said, th th there's, there's a compelling business case right there because there's untapped audience. Audience that still, believe it or not, still likes newspapers. I mean, I was in Sri Lanka uh, a, a year ago and, and in Asia, and, and people still love the tactile and, and, and the newspaper. And, and it's, it's, it's actually, um, to some extent, it's, 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 an, it's, it's a, a, new, new, a new and affluent community with disposable income, and increasingly so. And yet, somehow, mainstream media doesn't seem to think of it as worthy of, of their attention. It's true. Yes? That sort of relates to one of my questions. Is, are there any issues within the LGBT space that people are afraid to report on or shy away from reporting on? Yes. <laughs> um, I, think, I think, and this goes back to talking about the importance of having actual queer media, is mainstream media has gotten pretty good at responding when a terrible thing happens, when someone is subjected to homophobia or transphobia um, or violence, or when you have things concerning legislation, mainstream media is on that now. Great. Um, but it's not good at doing things that I think, well, they, they assume that only gay people are going to care about. For example, um, PrEP, which is uh, it's a treatment used uh, to prevent HIV um, in people who are negative. Um, it's a like, once-a-day pill. It just got approved in Canada for that use by Health Canada. And there's barely a peeping Canadian media about it. And it's been, it's been a huge conversation in gay communities as well as even in um, American media. 
and it was just not a thing here. Um, I think there's also a habit of the the mainstream media will cover, like I said, tragedy or violence, but not the day to day lived experiences of LGBT people. Um, that's one thing I think BuzzFeed does really well that I'm really grateful for is that it has stories about LGBT people that are actually light in tone. They're just about living their everyday lives. Like uh, they had a video series recently that was uh, trans women and trans men just having a conversation together on video. That's great. You would never see that, like someone else, um, like mainstream media doing that because they just assume it's a conversation their audience doesn't want to hear. You know, one of the interesting things that I've learned, and I wrote the book, and obviously in our household, we were pretty comfortable with the conversation. One of the, one of the insights that I had um, was I could do these book uh, signings, and there'd be families there, and generally the families um, had a, you know, a, a, a child that was gay or, or lesbian, and um, afterwards they'd come up and they want the book signed, but they still can't say out loud, hi, my son's gay, Can you, uh, here's the story, right? It's like, I have a family like yours, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so to me that was a great revelation that I think our assumption is that the conversation sh should be comfortable, but I, I personally, anyway, overestimated the degree of comfort among older Canadians anyway uh, with the conversation. And so when you're a broadcaster and you're thinking and you're looking at your demographic, I work for W5, the average age of the viewer is 72. Um, I, did a, I did a story on um, you know, a, a, a gay hockey player and there was a lot of nervousness about it. Um, so. I wish the conversation was easier to have, uh, but I've been surprised that it's as difficult still as it is. I think just that we're having the conversation, though, is critical to changing that. Sure. Um, and, you, you know, I was standing in someone's backyard um, uh, not that long ago, two very dear friends, um, both the man and the woman, not married to one another, have children. Uh, and I don't know how it came around to this, because we've known one another for years, but both of them said, oh, boy, I'm so glad my kid's not gay. I wouldn't want my kid, I know I'm okay with this, no problem, but it's just I would not want my child to be gay. And I thought, God, lady, I've known you people for years. Um, there's some distance yeah. to go. There's great tolerance for gay people as long as they're not too gay, which we touched upon right at the beginning of this. Like as long as they're like straight acting, not flamboyant, they're not challenging the gender binary, um, they're performing sort of as a straight person that's having to like have relationships with same sex, whatever, then that's fine, that's great. And I think that's why um, it was so easy to talk about uh, marriage equality in media because that is sort of still within the social structure of heteronormativity, uh, whereas talking about, I mean, I think we've been touched on this much, but trans issues are some, is something that media is terrible at covering. Can't even get the terminology correct. So I think that challenges um, this sort of mainstream, nice little like behaving gay person character we've created um, is problematic. We're even talking about nudity at Pride, remember how that was a whole big thing? Like talking about actual like sex when it comes to LGBT people is still kind of taboo. Yeah, there's not a, not, a, not a great deal of knowledge whatsoever on trans issues. Like none. none. Yeah. Uh, I just have a question that comes with it about audience assumptions and hiring and this notion that if you hire more diversity that things will change fairly rapidly because <clears throat> I find when I'm reading pieces in any number of women, I'll read the star or the, or the post that's queer content and I'm like, great, a queer story. And there's still this um, divide where I'm reading it and I feel like mm, this is actually a filter or um, an interpretation for a straight audience or a straight readership to understand queer culture. So examples would be something like, hey look kids, there's this whole new identity called gender queer. And we're going to infiltrate it and explain it to you where this is an identity or something that you know people in the queer community have known about for years. And you know, it, you know, there's this still 101 level of trying to explain this culture to uh, a main street audience because the assumption is it's you know probably 95% heterosexual. Um, so I'm just wondering, with the hiring of queer people, will that really change that much? Because the assumption is still going to be, you know, we have to have this filter on these stories to maybe dumb it down a bit or explain it, you know, so pe because people won't know what cisgender means or that it's probably more likely to be called transgender community, not transgender community, because most people in the straight community don't have queer people living there. Um, so I'm just curious about the length of time. 
time it takes, even with hiring practices, for that to change in the mainstream media, which my assumption is. I wonder yeah, whether I it's I wonder it's whether or not it, whether or not it's what what we do all the time, right? That it's like we're going to do that with economics, we're going to do that with politics, we're going to do that with like we're trying to explain concepts to each other. I don't know. I'll throw I, that out there. Sure, but also I feel like. Because I remember working um, at more mainstream publications like National Post. Yeah, if I use words cisgender in a story, I felt the need to explain what that meant. Um, or if someone using they and them pronouns, I felt the need to explain this is why this is this word is appearing in the story. Whereas now at BuzzFeed, where I have an audience that I can assume gets that, I don't have to explain it. That's new and exciting and wonderful. And I think hiring will, yes, part of it, but I think it's also there is a generation gap there. I remember seeing a study... Um, I think it was in the UK of young people, um, and something like almost 50% didn't identify as exclusively heterosexual, whether it meant like pansexual or queer or whatever, just not 100% straight. There seems to be um, a generation kind of a people where if you tell them, hi, I'm queer or I'm genderqueer or non-binary or whatever, they're like, cool, done. And that's, that doesn't exist for older generations. We just want to grace you for, um, I guess they're handed out in June. For uh, the story of a man uh, who went to his wife after 40 years and said, help me, I want to become a woman. And really, it's her story and the beauty in that relationship uh, of, of what happened and what, what they went through together. And they stayed together. Point being that the first person storytelling removes that filter. When you're hearing from the principles in the story, is a very powerful piece. Um, I actually don't remember much of any narration. So, you know, just, um, yes, it does make a difference. Uh, it makes a difference, it's an ideas business, it makes a difference right at the idea stage. It makes a difference in terms of the nuance and the understanding of the story. It makes a difference in terms of discussing next steps and how best to tell that story. And sometimes the most powerful way, certainly in the medium I'm in, radio, to tell that story is just to give voice to those people. Um, anyway, it's very powerful, and uh, if you get a chance to uh, to check it out, um, I think The Current will be both uh, playing it back and will be posting it on their site in June when it when it picks up the Gracie, but very, very powerful radio. First-person storytelling removes the filter. Yes? This might be slightly mean, but we've been talking about the issue of how diverse Toronto is and how we should be representing diversity. There's a substantial minority of people in the city who are getting their news not from CBC or the Globe or even BuzzFeed, but from newspapers and electronic media in other languages, Farsi, Punjabi, Cantonese. Do you have any sense of how this, this issue, the hiring, the rest of it, is playing out in the ethnic press? Because the ethnic press is a major player in Toronto. Across Canada, actually. Yes, yeah. yes that's true. I don't. I don't. <laughs> so there you go. I assume they hire ethnic people who speak the language. <laughs> That's what yeah. But you know, in terms of hiring, language issues are, in, or language, um, is increasingly important when you're building, when you're building a team. Um, it wasn't. Uh, I think it was 2003 when young Cecilia Jang went missing. She was kidnapped from her bedroom while she slept. And uh, we were given access to her parents who broke their silence um, under one condition that we would that we would do the interview in Mandarin. And because we had someone on our team who spoke Mandarin and Cantonese, um, we were able to get that interview. But it was a very powerful piece. It was like some extraordinary length, like it was 12 minutes long, all in Mandarin. And you can hear, whoa, sorry, you can hear the emotion in the mother's voice um, and, and the power uh, of that story. Language skills are increasingly important in all our newsrooms um, and um, not just to ethnic press if we want to create teams that are reflective of our communities. We do, we do underestimate the size of that audience. I, I used to um, uh, anchor Global National. And Global National is a Cantonese version of its newscast. And that's simply about taking the same resources to make something in English 
that you can then make in another language, and that's just scalability of a business, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes there's a lot of organizations that assume the audience is English speaking when, you know, there's still money to be made uh, repurposing the same content across uh, across languages. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Stefan, and I'm the founder of a uh, recruiting and consulting company that focuses on diversity. And I wanted to get the opinion of the panel around these conversations of identity. One of the things that wasn't brought up is how a lot of straight white men do talk about identity, just in very subtle ways. So where a gay person might actually have to say, I'm gay, a straight person will just have pictures of their wife and kids on their desk. So in moving forward in this conversation, when do you think this step should come in, or should it, that we start looking back to those older straight white men and helping them learn that them talking about identity is part of this broader conversation, and it doesn't just have to be them sitting back going, why do all these LGBT people talk about being LGBT all the time? I don't talk about my identity. I suspect it's generational. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure that white guys have that conversation at a certain age. I don't know. Um, I think one thing that's interesting is when I was sort of debating about like coming out in the newsroom, like how to do, what do I do, what do I talk about, I'm dating ladies, whatever. Um, <laughs> part of it was like I started convincing myself like it doesn't matter, you don't have to say anything, no one else is saying anything. But then you start realizing like my coworker just talked about going on a date last night or talked about their girlfriend or their husband. Um, it's part of just like banter among people and yet people talk about their identities all the time. It's just when you are, when you're gay, for example, it feels like it's like a very loaded identity. Yeah, I know my son doesn't have any problem with it in his workplace, but he's in advertising and it's a different kind of a diversity in advertising, certainly. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on whether you're in a creative business, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it depends if you're, um, your age. Um, I'm trying to think of the last time and maybe, maybe just because my friend group, you know, knows my son's gay, that they they self filter. But I can't remember a conversation like that in 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 my circle. Uh, but maybe that's just because my circle is special. I don't know. We are seeing a rise in sort of men's rights groups, and 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 to some extent, at least in parts of the U.S., white sort of white supremacy again. And um, and, and I think that's a kind of a, in a way a backlash to um, to the to the inevitable backlash. I mean, it's not uh, to to some some uh, uh, you know a sense of being threatened. I mean, a lot of the Trump supporters come from the from the place that they're being threatened by immigrants and being edged out of jobs by immigrants who, who undercut and accept lower lower uh, and 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 I mean. Diversity, to, in general, should really mean um, multiple voices, not just um, not just uh, racial or sexual diversity, but but everybody and its age and its geographic and its uh, class and social income, uh, and that 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 if you really want to create a diverse place, you you don't just tick two boxes on the diversity checklist. Yeah, uh, I wonder. Uh, what are you doing as journalists, as the media, to stop the cliches and the stereotypes of the gay community? Like we were kidding here, and we all kid about like being gay, fucking very gay, being a lesbian, looking very lesbian. And what we really mean is how masculine you are as a man, or how feminine you are as a man, or how masculine you are as a woman, or how feminine you are as a woman. Because that really affects in the regular life. I'm a gay man, and I'm and just going to work, for example, like these organizations, sometimes they hire people who are very, very gay, as we are saying, because it's the way that people will see that they are filling out the quota of the diversity. But there are many other people, like most average gay and lesbian people, who are normal people, who are not qualified for how feminine or masculine are, and they cannot fill out that. And I think the media, has a big, big voice to change that. So I wonder how are you, or what are you doing to change that? Well, that's why you're talking about the idea of like masculinity and femininity. Um, so I think one thing media still does is it really enforces the idea of a gender binary in general. And, that, and so much of homophobia, I think, is hatred at people based on the fact that you're not performing as male or female the way that you're expected to. Um, so I think one thing that I've been very mindful of and trying to do is um, 
is to get away from the gender binary altogether. For example, if I'm writing a piece about um, abortion access or menstruation, like the tampon tax, for example, don't say women, say people who have periods, people, people who can, uh, people who have babies, because there are, of course, trans men who have periods. Or if I'm interviewing a subject, I ask what their pronouns are, even if I think it might be obvious. Just ask, do you prefer he or her or them um, and respect their choices? I think that's just a small thing that everybody can be doing. I think um, <clears throat> in my reporting recently, um, because my audience is older, uh, what I've been trying to do is um, um, play people off their own uh, uh, biases. So, for instance, when I did that feature on the on the hockey player, I used every sort of masculine stereotype hockey player, tall guy. All the guys in his team were saying he's an awesome guy, and then the the viewer finds out after the fact that the kid's gay after they fall in love with him, basically. And it's you know it's it's sort of like the Rock Hudson thing, right? Or you know, or uh, or uh, Caitlyn Jenner. It's like you have to know the person before almost, and then that helps you get over that hump, um, and. I mean, it's not the way that I would fashion it if I was talking to myself or people that I know, but I've tried to, um, I've tried to have that moment where it's like, oh, because all of a sudden they're challenged with what their preconceived notions were, if that makes any sense. I always, uh, I always say, uh, if we do our jobs really well, we can make people think, uh, if not differently, more deeply. And I think helping people understand um, is the first step forward hugely and so that's you know the choices that we make every day in the stories we tell and the portrayal of those stories uh, that is the new normal um, the authentic portrayal of and of course within any community there's uh, a range and all kinds of uh, different types of people you need to present that uh, in order to help people understand um, and um, and that's a key. You know, years and years ago, I was um, was in Halifax, and I did a story. There was a there was a particular issue at the time. Uh, I kept hearing these rumors that if you were young and black, um, you weren't welcome in the downtown bars and nightclubs. Anyway, this the station I was at uh, went tell the story. Went to CBC, took some time, hired a young cub reporter named Jean Carter, who would go on to be the uh, assignment editor at CBC Toronto News. And um, she went into the community and started documenting uh, some of these cases. But the, the real um, moment would come when one of the bar owners would say on tape, yeah, there's a problem with racism in the city of Halifax, but it's not me. My white patrons don't want to share the dance floor with black people. So we weed them out at the door. You know, I remember when we were changing CBC Toronto in 2001, and people would still call them. People don't call now. <laughs> they email you or text you or whatever. But people would call, and they would say, you know, get those accents off the air. Uh, we're not listening anymore. And, and part of what we did, you know, in telling that story, and part of what we did in changing our airwaves to be more reflective is educating your public too, right? And that's what begins to create and generate that, that sort of societal change that you're talking about. Um, well, it, do you agree that there's a, I mean, that part of the role of the media is to, is it to educate? Um, I, I, it, again, I, I, I don't think education is the only thing, but, 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 but there is, it, is, it is part of it. Um, um, I, I should hope that there's there's a there's, there's value. I mean, coming from um, the arts coverage, there's also value in entertainment and enjoy enjoyment. Um, but but I think all all of this really to me is that we are a country in flux in a way with our demographics, and we're a country that is going through change. Um, at a, and the change is happening at a rapid pace at the moment because the technology is helping that. Immigration is help, is changing. And all these questions, I mean, they are not going to be sorted out tonight. They're not going to be sorted out next year. I mean, we, we, it, it is really a demographic revolution in a way. That's, that's the backdrop of everything we're talking about today. That's a pretty good way to end, I think, is, uh, unless anybody has anything urgent. Kicker. The yeah. Is the, closer. the closer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Kevin. Uh, good evening. My name is Natalie Turvey. I'm Executive Director of the Canadian Journalism Foundation. On behalf of the CJF, I'd like to thank our panel for their candor and their insights into the evolution of LGBT coverage and for sharing their experiences on changing newsroom culture. And our thanks to uh, Kevin Newman for leading tonight's talk. He brings so much to this and made it uh, a discussion we can all benefit from. Please join me in another round of appreciation for our speakers. Before we head into the cocktail reception, I'd like to preview some of our upcoming CJFJ talks. Uh, we hope you'll join us, and uh, you can have a look at our, our slides. On May 5th, Richard Jingris, head of Google News, is with us in conversation with Globe and Mail's David Wamsley on the sometimes fraught relationship between the tech giant and the news media. And uh, if you don't get your fill of David Wamsley on May 5th, he's back on May 19th in conversation with Amy Goodman, award-winning investigative journalist and host of Democracy Now! They'll be talking about the US election, America's role in international conflicts, and uh, running an in in independent news show for the last 20 years. On May 26th, we explore disruption and the intersection of news and technology with digital pioneer Emily Bell in conversation with the Boston Globe's David Scott. And on June uh, 16th, we're celebrating outstanding Canadian journalistic achievement at the CJF's annual awards gala. Uh, along with our awards and fellowships, we'll pay tribute to power media couple Sir Harold Evans and Tina Brown. As well, we're joined by the Boston Globe's Pulitzer Prize winning Spotlight team, uh, who'll accept a special citation for their fearless journalism exposing sexual abuse and cover up by the Catholic Church in Boston. So thanks to all of you for supporting CJFJ Talks. You can find details about uh, these events on our website and Twitter feed. And finally, our, our thanks to TD on behalf of the foundation, uh, not just for this, this uh, terrific space this evening, but for leading conversations around inclusion and diversity and social change. So thank you, and I would like to now invite you to meet our panel and join us for a cocktail reception and continue the conversation in the next room. Thanks so much. <laughs>